when I started uh, translating the 17th century Dutch records of New Netherland, which, by the way, are the earliest records of New York State, 40 years ago, I ran across a quotation from a historian, which uh, bothered me at first, but uh, I figured I'd have to do something about it. He said that New Netherland was the best kept secret of the history of the United States or of, of America, the best kept secret. And I could, uh, I could see that because I was uh, translating at a desk in the back of a room. I had no telephone. I had no typewriter. I had practically nothing but a flat surface and access to the Dutch records when I began. Where did these records come from? They're generated by the Dutch over a period of 60 years. Hudson, as you know, came from the... He was supposed to go to the east over Siberia. Uh, this was a contract that was drawn up by the East India Company in 1609. Instead, he turned and went the other way when he ran into heavy ice flows and his crew was about to mutiny. He came down the coast, was blown off course almost to Cape Hatteras, went up into Delaware Bay, all the way up the Hudson to about where the Patroon Island Bridge is uh, today. Came back out and sailed back to England, but his, uh, his journal made it back and the ship eventually made it back to the Netherlands. This allowed the Dutch to lay claim to this area. No one had laid claim to it before. Apparently the English simply assumed that it would be theirs, but the Dutch made a good case by right of exploration. So the territory of the Dutch ran from Delaware Bay all the way to Cape Cod originally, until the English kept pushing them further and further to the west, eventually to the uh, Fresh River, as they called it, the Fersa Revere, or the uh, Connecticut River, and then eventually in about as far as here. The Dutch were lucky in being able to lay claim to the one area below the St. Lawrence River Valley that had an access to the interior of the country. New England was sitting on a shelf with no way of getting to the Indians who were bringing furs in from the west. And Virginia and Maryland were in the same situation until the 1750s when the Cumberland Gap is opened. The Dutch dominated the fur trade as a result of this. They had a trading post here at Fort Orange. They had a uh, village or settlement at Manhattan. Furs were brought in from the west by the Indians. They traded at the trading post at Fort Orange. They were brought down and then sent uh, to Europe. Over the years, 17 settlements were established in New Netherland. Some 9,000 people uh, lived here when the English arrived in uh, 1664. For nine years, the English uh, worked with the Dutch, more or less, and then the Dutch came back during the Third Anglo-Dutch War and uh, repossessed this whole area for about 14 months, and then it was negotiated away to uh, the English and became permanently New York. Now, how deep a footprint did the Dutch make when they were here? Some writers have said that it was a minimal. In fact, some writers don't even like to talk about the Dutch because it's uh, inconvenient when they want to uh, get to the revolution as quickly as possible. Using myself as an example, I grew up in a small village in the Mohawk Valley uh, called Nelliston. I was born in Fort Plain across the river, and after World War II, my father bought a house in Nelliston. It's very close to Canajoharie, where the beech nut baby food plant used to be. Some of you may be familiar with it. But it's right in the center of the Mohawk Valley. Our house was surrounded by families with names such as Van Alstein, Van Vechten, Van Schaik, Van Steenburgen, Van Falkenburg. They weren't 
considered immigrants. They weren't considered even Dutch. They were considered old Dutch. Whenever I asked as a kid, they were old Dutch, and I had this feeling that they had been there forever. And uh, there were other immigrants coming in at that time, Germans and Italians and so forth, but nothing like these established families, the, uh, the Vans. There were also other Dutch families, Timmerman uh, family, I remember, and there were a bunch of carpenters. They had translated their name from Timmerman to Carpenter, uh, as, was, as was very common at that time. The Cooper, the Cappers became Coopers and so forth. My father had chickens out back. It was my job to feed the chickens every day. I went out with a bag of, bag of corn, and I'd go, kip, 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 and the chickens would come running. Well, they knew I had corn, too. But kip is chicken in Dutch. We used to go out playing in farmer's fields. Our village was surrounded by dairy farms. I'd come home after crawling through barbed wire fences with corner cuts in my pants. And my mother would say, I see you've got another winkle hawk in your pants. Does anyone, anyone here familiar with the term winkle hawk as a corner cut? A, a winkle hawk is a carpenter square in Dutch. And it's the term that was used for that corner cut that you get in denim fabric when you, when you catch it in, on a barb in a barbed wire fence. During recess, I remember third, fourth grade, we would go out at 10 o'clock and we, we would play uh, knickers or knickers, K-N-I-K, like a knickerbocker. Knickerbocker means marble baker in Dutch. And everybody had a bag of marbles and we'd go out and play knickers. There are all kinds of terms like this that I didn't realize until I left the area that these were uncommon terms. Uncommon terms in West Virginia, for example, where I went to school for a while. But what about other evidence of this footprint, the depth of the foot, footprint? The Dutch left behind 12,000 pages of documents. Some of them were destroyed in the uh, 1911 fire and in other calamities that uh, occurred uh, over the years, the revolution. They were kept on uh, warships, prison ships by the English in the harbor where they were eaten by rats uh, because of the paste sizing on the documents. But 12,000 pages survive, and that's what I've been working on for 40 years. 12,000 pages of court minutes, council minutes, correspondence, land records, notarial records, uh, which indicate uh, marriages and uh, deaths, surveys, inventories of estates. We have the inventory of Jonas Bronck's uh, house that the name, the Bronx is named after. It gives a, 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 descript, a description of his entire library. That leads us to the question of, uh, so what? And this is, this, is the, this is the question that you always have to answer no matter what research you're doing is, so what? Why am I wasting my time even listening to you right now? The Dutch brought over many attributes. One of the things they brought over was a diversity of population. They brought over, because their population in the Netherlands at that time was very diverse. Think of the mid-1600s. Not only did you have all kinds of climate problems, but you had the Thirty Years' War which was causing a displacement of thousands and thousands of people. Many of them ended up in the Netherlands, not only because it was convenient to come down the three major river systems which lead to the Netherlands, the Schelt, the Maas, and the, and the Rhine, but because they had a very good social welfare system. They took care of their poor. 
and the Netherlands was the place to go. They also had an outlet to the new worlds. They had the East India Company and the West India Company that they could uh, sign on to and go off to the Far East where they would never be seen again usually, or to the new world uh, uh, in North America. It's very easy to make the argument when you look at the statistics and the people who are coming over here that this is the origin of the melting pot, is New Netherland. New England, the tobacco colonies of Virginia and Maryland are very homogeneous, but New Netherland is very diverse in its population. Several other attributes that they brought over, social mobility. If you had ambition and talent, you could move up the social ladder and then marry someone who had a lot of money. And this was a very typical Dutch uh, way of getting ahead. Once you reached a status, a certain status, you, you could uh, argue that you should be part of this family. The Schuylers, for example, they started as river boatmen in the Rhine, but they soon uh, went right to the top. In fact, one of them became a general, a very famous general in the revolution. The other attribute is toleration. Toleration, when I say toleration, I intend freedom of conscience. The Dutch West India Company didn't allow anyone here but Dutch Reformed. That was the only religion that was sanctioned. And I think it's because it concentrated all the money they were getting for social uh, welfare to, to come into one program to the deacon's accounts rather than being dispersed. Freedom of conscience allowed anyone to uh, believe in whatever they wanted, Quakers, Lutherans, uh, Anabaptists, uh, who were called Vader dopers those who baptized again. It allowed them to live without being persecuted. The Dutch survived here for a long period of time, much longer than, uh, than the English takeover in 1664. There's an interesting anecdote among the Schuylers in the 1880s. They describe how they would have Sunday dinner. All of the Schuylers in the area would come to the, the house. They would uh, have this big meal. Afterwards, the men would go to the billiard room to play uh, billiards, smoke cigars, drink brandy, and so forth. The women would all go into the kitchen and speak Dutch. This was 1880. The Dutch language survived for a long period of time because it was a part of their identity, a part of their heritage, and it survived among the women the longest because they were the ones who were isolated, <laughs> unfortunately, out in the countryside. The men would go in and they would have to become bilingual in order to become part of the economy but the women were home. They raised the children to become bilingual as well, to learn Dutch. So this is why Dutch survived for a long period of time. Cervantes uh, once wrote of translators, and I always took this to heart myself, that uh, a translation is like a carpet viewed on the reverse side, where you see all of the threads and can barely make out the design uh, of this beautiful fabric on the, on the reverse. This is pretty much what New Netherland was when I started. It was a carpet in reverse. We are slowly turning the carpet over, and I hope someday you'll be able to see the entire uh, design. Thank you.